folk in it who still have faith when your faith is weak to lift you up, deliver you to Jesus for spiritual and physical healing as the need arises. Because one day that palate that you help will be the palate that you're on. Is any among you weighed down, burdened? He says, interesting, he must pray. He didn't say he should pray. It would be nice if he did pray. Aren't you a Christian? You're supposed to pray. No, he says you got to. You must pray. So we pray generically, but now he's talking about praying specifically tied to the sickness, the suffering, and the burden of weight. This is not, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep it. If I die before I wait, pray the Lord my soul to take. That's cute prayer. That's like what you're going to do this afternoon. Lord, bless this food to the nourishment of my body. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, you kind of say it, wrote, you're not thinking about it. There's something about the burden of life. That cute prayers don't work. When the weight overwhelms you, when the tears flow and the heart aches and the body is grimacing in pain or whatever the suffering happens to be, he says he must make contact with heaven. This is a requirement, an expectation, a demand. This is not the time to run from God. It's the time to run to him. He says, you must pray. You must make contact in the difficult circumstances of life. He says, is anyone among you sick? The body is frail, hurting. He must. These are strong terms. So we're told throughout the scripture to pray about all things generally, but then he calls us in these particular weights of life to make sure history makes contact with heaven and time makes a link with eternity that you call down the programming. That programming that has been pre-decreed but is waiting for a call. He says, you must pray. Now, There are times in life when the burdens get so big, the weight gets so heavy, you don't feel you can call. You don't want to pray. You don't have the strength to read the Bible. The needs, the pain, the ache, the hurt, the tears, the stress, the struggle are just too much. He says, then you must call the elders of the church and they ought to pray over him. He says, if you can't pray, you better get some folk who can. If the weight and burdens of life are so heavy and you can't make contact, which he says you do in the first suffering, but then he says, okay, well, if, if it gets that deep, you call the elders of the church. Now, why the elders of the church? Well, that gets into ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. God has a central institution in his kingdom program in history, the church. The church is not just a place where you come here preaching, singing, and, 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 and uh, praise. It's, it's all of that, fellowship and all of that. But it's, Jesus says, you shall call my house the house of prayer. He never said, call my house the house of preaching. He never said, call my house the house of singing. He never said, call my house the house of fellowship. The house has all that. But he says, if you want to give my house a title, give it the house of prayer. Because the main thing that the church should be known for is prayer. Because he has chosen this place that is a biblically based church to be a support mechanism to help people get to him who can't get to him by themselves. And that's why every Christian is expected to be a meaningful member of a local church so that they can become a support system. Because you may not need it now, but I can bet you your bottom dollar there will come a time in your life when you're going to need somebody to pray for you and with you because you can't pray for or with yourself because the burden is too great. He says, call the elders of the church. That should be the spiritual leadership to come alongside and lift you up in a place you can't go on your own. Every Sunday morning, the elders gather before the first service and people schedule to come meet with us who are overwhelmed with a burden that they can't handle. 
that they can't get to God. They feel on their own. And we surround those by appointment with prayer so that they know that we don't just, we're not just here for them to come to church. We're here to pray with them in the burdens of life because this is the specific task that he's given the church. But he's also giving it to believers one to another. That's why he talks about confess one to another. So there is this horizontal thing, not just by the leadership, but from believer to believer. In Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, you have an interesting story. It's the story of the paralytic, which means he can't stand up. He's paralyzed. He's laying on a pallet. His, his, his get up and go has gotten up and gone, and he has no capacity to get up on his own two feet. But he has four homeboys, four posses, who come along and lift up a man who couldn't lift himself up because he had been paralyzed. Because sometimes the burdens of life paralyze you. You don't know what to say, what to do, where to go, who to talk to, because you're stuck in, in your place. Well, they saw their buddy paralyzed. Jesus was down the street teaching. He was in a house. The house was jam-packed. Nobody could get in or out because everybody had shown up to hear Jesus' teaching. But the paralyzed man, the paralytic, is in a crisis. He wanted to get to the house, but he couldn't get there because he was stuck in his condition. So his four buddies grabbed his pallet and went to the house, saw they couldn't get in. They climbed up on the roof of the house, Mark chapter 2 says, cut a hole in the roof, lowered the paralytic down, and the Bible says when the paralytic was lowered down in front of Jesus, so Jesus is teaching out here, he looks up and here comes this pallet coming down in front of him. The Bible says when Jesus, watch this, saw their faith. He healed the paralytic. When Jesus saw their faith, because sometimes life gets so hard, you don't have any faith. You got to piggyback on the faith of other folk who do have faith, who can take you to Jesus because you can't get there on your own. And it says, the four took him, lowered him down, and when they, when Jesus saw their faith, he healed the man and forgave him of his sins. Now that tells us a lot. That means he was paralyzed because he was messed, he messed up. He was paralyzed because there was unaddressed sin in his life. So they took him to Jesus for two reasons. To heal his spiritual life so Jesus was free to heal his physical life. Because sometimes if your spiritual life is out of whack, your physical life is going to be tore up from the floor up. But if you can get the spiritual address, then God is free to address the physical or circumstantial because now you're dealing with the whole person. You're not just getting a blessing to fix the external without any concern about your relationship with God on the internal. But my point is they picked up his pallet. One day, you're going to be on a pallet. You're going to be in a paralyzed situation and you won't know how to get to God on your own. Well, you better be connected with a local church that's got some folk in it who still have faith when your faith is weak to lift you up, deliver you to Jesus for spiritual and physical healing as the need arises. Because one day that pallet that you help will be the pallet that you're on. So you want to make sure that you are a part. That's why every believer in a local church is not just supposed to be a, 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 a smo, a Sunday morning only. They're supposed to be an active uh, servant of the kingdom of God, serving the family of God so that needs are being met. That's what he means when he goes on to say anointing them with oil. He says you are to pray for them, anointing them with oil. Any of y'all remember castor oil? Yeah. When I was growing up, castor oil was for everything. Everything. Uh, you had a headache, get some castor oil. You had a stomach ache, get, a, get some castor oil. Your arm is dislocated. Get a castor oil. You got a, you got a grown-in toenail. Get castor oil. My mama had castor oil for every single thing. It was that one-stop shop 
for, for, for whatever was wrong in your life. When he says anointing them with oil, he is using that, you know, when you did the symbol of oil to bring health and healing. In other words, the church, once it does pray for you, is to come alongside and anoint you. That is, bring practical assistance as it is able to improve in your lot. It's not just to say, be warm, be filled, and, and God bless you. It's to use the ministry of the church, the ministers of the church, and the kingdom servants within the church to come alongside as the church in order to bring practical support, whether it's counseling, whether it's encouragement, whether it's correction, because the church is supposed to be a hospital. Last time I checked, sick people are welcome at a hospital, but when sick people show up at a hospital, it's not supposed to be a hospice. A hospice is where you uh, die. A hospice is all the hospice is doing is making you comfortable in your demise. The church is not supposed to just make folk comfortable while they die, but be a hospital to birth life and hope and help and meaning and healing in their life. And that sometimes means surgery and medication and other things. When he says bring the oil, that symbol of giving,